It's absolutely aptacular. The Subject Cinema Android app. Everything you need to be a rabid Subject Cinema fan. Subject Cinema, 3-Minute Weekend, Tuesday Digidex, and Front Row 5 and 10. All right at your fingertips and available instantly. Plus, email and voicemail links, Facebook and Twitter hookups, Patreon support specials, and more is coming real soon. Don't just listen. App it. The all-in-one Subject Cinema podcast app. Android version available now at Google Play or on PNR Network websites. Amazon and iPhone apps coming soon. Don't delay. Download today. Blueberry. This podcast is a member of the Blueberry Network. Blueberry. No ease. That's Blueberry. B-L-U-B-R-R-Y. Dot com. Blueberry dot com. This podcast is a proud member of the Lamb Podcasting Network. Find the network at largeassmovieblogs.com. Oh, what's wrong? There's a bucket of candy right in front of you. I'm having post-holiday letdown. Well, we got another holiday to look forward to. We got two of them, actually. Three if you include your birthday. Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> and all kinds of good food coming your way. We're going to make all kinds of great stuff coming up for Thanksgiving and Christmas and your birthday. I suppose. Cake and ice cream and fudge and gingerbread. And, and that's just the desserts. But there's no more zombies. I can make zombies for you if you want, but I don't think you'd handle them. Your cholesterol medicine would would make you like just puke it up again. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I guess. There's things to be happy about, I suppose, and there's things to be thankful for, especially this month here on Subject Cinema, where we're going to be looking at food in movies and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So I guess I shouldn't be sad. Yeah. And we got a lot more stuff, including some serious stuff, and a, a lot more all this week, right here, right now, as we enter November and a special month of food devoted shows. Yes. I'm TC Kirkham. I'm Kim Brown. Like sands through the bread lines. This is subject cinema. If you have sand in your bread, you're baking it entirely wrong. Stand by to receive our transmission. <laughs> this town needs an enema. Celebrating a decade of film. Podcasting, lasting out of Beantown, USA, you're tuned into Subject Cinema with T.C. Kirkham and Kim Brown. Directive. Oh, behave. <laughs> yeah. I volunteer as tribute. Suppose you run your business and let me run mine. Here's looking at you, kid. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome TC and Kim. You have a seat here, right, right here, ma'am. Okay. And pull up. Would you like some water while you look at your uh, while you look at the menu here? Ah, uh, thank you. Hmm. Oh, I can't decide. Everything looks so good. It does, doesn't it? Hope it looks good to you too. As we get into a new month, call, we're calling Subject Cinema Presents Cinema Du Jour. Yes. I'm T.C. Kirkham. Hi, I'm Kim Brown. Subject Cinema number 588. Yep. Don't, before we get started, we want to remind everybody listening that there's certain things you need to do when you are listening to this program. Number one, when you're listening, especially on YouTube, but anywhere, you've got to make sure you like the, the episode and don't forget to subscribe wherever you're listening, whether it's YouTube, SoundCloud, Libsyn, or on our site. Always hit the subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, hit the notification button so you'll get every new episode when it hits you. Don't forget to download the Subject Cinema app where you get all of our Subject Cinema-based shows, Subject Cinema, Front Row 5 and 10, 3-Minute Weekend, and Tuesday Digitex, all in one place. And don't forget, your support makes this show work. Patreon.com backslash PNR Networks. You could start at $2 a month, and the more you do, uh, more patrons we get, the better the programming we can do. Yep. So make sure you're participating. Yes. Without your help, who knows what could happen? So, food. Yes. 
Um, we are talking about food in a lot of the shows we're doing this month on the subject cinema because food is obviously terribly important to And because know, it's Thanksgiving existing. month. Yes, because, you know, this is th- the month of Thanksgiving in America, and Thanksgiving is obviously a very important holiday. You know, it's the day you're supposed to be thankful for what you have in your life, you know, family and friends and good times and prosperity and stuff like that. Obviously, all very important things, which you should be thankful for all the time anyway, but they have this one special day out of the year where you're supposed to be uber thankful for it. And, you know, it's the day that you're supposed to be together with, you know, family. and Even you know, if the family isn't really paying attention to you, if they're men and they're watching football. Yeah. That was sexist. Women watch football, too. Yeah, but not as much as the men cause well, the, uh, on Thanksgiving because the women are usually helping out with the meal. You're not making this any easier. I'm telling well, the no, truth. <laughs> I know. Well, unless unless you're a guy that's an awesome cook like you. Uh, fine, but oh. still, it, it, it works out to yeah. a higher ratio of men watching football and, and women I know. in the kitchen. No offense, no sexist things meant. I know. Honestly, you take my innocent little thing and turn it into a sexist thing. I wasn't trying. To. Honestly, all I was gonna say was, you know, it's the day when you you gather together with, you know, your your family, your extended family, and all these people that par- are part of your family, and then you realize why you only see some of these people once a year. <laughs> And, uh, this was not a personal reflection on my family. I'd like or to just, mine. Or I'd like to just really? get that out there. Necessarily. That, that's called CYA, children. Um, this episode is going to focus a lot on chicken. We have a lot of ex- stuff to talk about when it comes to chicken. Because chicken happens to be the most favoritest food of somebody in this room. It ain't me. <laughs> I mean, I like chicken. Well, just because there's a lot of chicken stuff out there that we could do. Well, I mean, we have a deja vu review. We have a few other things involved. Chickens are part of, of our 13 report this week. Yes. And to kick things off, one of our two new renamed segments for this month, as we kick off our Salute to TV cooking. Yes. With the Chicken Sisters. The Chicken Sisters. Miss Broiler, Miss Fryer, Miss Roaster, Miss Caponette, Miss Stewart, and old Madam Hen. But we're spotlighting Miss Roaster of the Year, measuring in at 14, 15, 14. We're roasting Miss Chicken today on The French Chef. There is a lot more to Julia Child than just the Chicken Sisters. No. <laughs> I love that opening. That's from a 1971, I think, episode of the show. Mm-hmm. But The French Chef was one of the longest running um, shows of its type, running from 1962 to 1973? 63 to February 63 to January 73. And she would follow that up with Julia Child and Company, Julia Child and More Company. Baking with Julia, all kinds of other other shows shows. like that. But The French Chef is where I first got hooked on cooking shows. Mm -hmm. I was, I don't know, four or five, and it would come in... On the on the UHF channel from Columbus, Ohio, I was gonna say, and you'd were you barely li- be able to see it, but you could hear it. I was going to say, were you living in in Ohio or Washington? I was time? living in Ohio at uh-huh. the time. That's the first place I saw her, and and it was like, wow, okay, you can't really hear it, but you can hear that. Dis- I can't really see it, but you ha- can hear that distinct voice of hers, uh-huh. and and I would sit there and just laugh because she she'd talk and snort and talk and snort and. And it was hilarious. And my mother would be trying to figure out what I was watching. Now, my mom was, of course, a big Galloping Gourmet fan. That was on in syndication every day for a while. Mm -hmm. But Julia Child um, was my first exposure to cooking in a big way. And it was made by WGBH in Boston. Yes. And since that time and Zoom, I always wanted to be up here. And I finally made it 20-some years ago. Mm -hmm. I love the Boston area. It's my favorite place to be. And it's because of Julia Child that I'm here. Well, that's nice. <laughs> or one of the reasons. Not to mention the fact that she's always been a great, fantastic performance artist. Yeah. And I would class her as a performance artist. Um, she does, uh, especially, now you can catch Julia, if, you, if you're, if you well, it used to be free for Amazon Prime members, now it's not anymore, but the original shows, the first six seasons, were free for a while for Amazon Prime. And that's the first time I'd seen them all. Mm-hmm. I caught up in all of them at least once. Yeah. And I, I, um... I mean, she really knew. 
that she because they did this show with no edits. Nope. Everything they did had to stay in the show because they had no budget. Yep. No money for editing. No anything like that. And so you'd see this. So stuff stuff, stuff would go wrong. That's why you got show. that whole toss the potatoes. Ooh. Oh, well, that didn't work out very well, did it? Well, we're in the kitchen and no one else is to know who's to see. You yeah. know, that came out of that, that mindset. And it made Julia a household word. Yes. You, do you remember watching Julia I at do. All? I remember watching The French Chef. Or, well, I don't actually, I tell a lie. I don't remember watching The French Chef as in consciously being the one that put that on. Right. Well, I, I didn't remember, do that until I was in high school. I but. remember The French Chef being on... When I was a child, now growing up in Boston, um, outside of Boston, the Boston suburb, um, and my mom being a, a homemaker when I was very young, my, you know, I mean, she worked and then they had, you know, they had me and she stayed home. And then after my sister was old enough, she went back to work. But when I was young, she was home and she would have the French chef on sometimes. And it would also be that the TV would be on channel two. Because she wanted me to watch educational stuff like Sesame Street and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, you know, regular cartoons of people hitting people with hammers and bricks (laughs) and stuff like that. You know, which I kind of get um, because, you know, goodness knows. But the funny thing is I remember being a small child and I was afraid of her. (laughs) Julia, I mean, not my mom. Um, I was... I was frightened of Julia. I, I was her voice frightened me. I'd never heard anyone with that sort of voice before. And I remember being a child and I mean I wasn't like screaming running out of the room frightened, but I remember being like, What is wrong with that lady? <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> I was very ignorant. I was a child, give me a break. But I Remember, and I remember my mom kind of watching, and I remember watching the, like, you know, paying kind of attention to the food she would be making. I don't remember any of the black and white stuff. All I remember is the color stuff. Right. I, but I do remember. The color stuff started in 1969. Mm-hmm. This is when they, and that's when the, the, the more. Yeah. Oh, that's the theme that's, no, that's from the color one. I do remember yeah. when I was a young child thinking why my kitchen, my mom's kitchen, you know, it wasn't my kitchen, it was my mom's kitchen. That was, you know, <laughs> the kitchen was mom's place. Right. You, know, you didn't touch stuff in the kitchen because mm-hmm. you could burn yourself. Anyway. You know, um, and knowing me, I would have definitely burned myself. Off on um, a tangent. Sorry. Come on, pull yourself back I, in I, line. <laughs> I could never figure out why my mom's kitchen didn't work like the kitchen from the lady on TV. You know, the whole idea that you put something in the oven that was on the bottom and then you take it out of the oven that's on the top and it's all done. I could never figure out why. Julia actually explained that. And in the early shows, she would be like, I have one I happened to make earlier today and it's almost finished, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, I guess I can never And she And some part, of the stuff yeah. she actually made in entirety throughout the show. Yeah, but I, I was always like, why isn't my mom's kitchen like that? <laughs> you know, I just, I could never figure out why it didn't work that way. I think my mom finally was like, well, they, they do that before. So and I was like, oh. Mm-hmm. You know, well, I was the kind of kid that thought people lived in the radio. So, you know. I had a very fanciful imagination even when I was a child. What can I tell you? But I remember when I was a little older and seeing the French chef and seeing the food that she made. Obviously, the French chef, it was all it was you know, French cooking and stuff like that, teaching French cooking to an American audience. And it wasn't like the incredibly fancy French cooking. It was more the, the rustic style stuff. You Wouldn't you agree on her show? Some of it on, on the show, well, I don't know. Some of it was the fancy stuff, but others were more rustic like you'd find in the French countryside. Yeah. It depended on what the theme of the show was. She would do different stuff. The, as she got into the color ones, it became more of a, a more expansive Mm-hmm. Uh, array of French food, but but the earlier shows were a lot of the ritzy stuff that you would have at like dinner parties. And right. Stuff. I I remember looking at it, and I remember thinking, you know, I mean, who was... else is going to eat aspic for Christ's sake? No, that stuff is nasty. Not if I, <laughs> I don't was... even like Jello. I am not touching meat Jello. Meat Thank Jello. You. That's no. pretty much all it is, and that's just <laughs> horrible. But I remember watching it and being like, oh, you know, it's like, oh, that's how you do this, that, and the other mm-hmm. thing, and 
hey, this is really kind of cool. You know, I never... Re- watching her is uh, kind of weird because watching her and watching other cooking shows, that taught me more about cooking than watching my mom cook. Yeah, me because too. Because when you're watching your mom cook, you're not really watching your mom cook. You're watching your mom's back as she's, like, going from here to here to here to here to here. You're not standing over her shoulder looking at stuff. Unless, because- unless she's t- teaching you. Well, yeah, be, yeah, but even I mean, when I was a kid, that's how I learned. I would, I would watch stuff on the French Chef, and then Mom would start finding weird recipes all over the place. What are you? I'm not making this. Where did you get this? Well, but my point is, you, you literally could look over her shoulder, Julia, as she's cooking, yeah. or she'd be cooking right in front of you. You couldn't do that in your mom's kitchen because a, you'd be in the way, and b, you know, you'd be, you'd be in the way. And, <laughs> I don't know about you when you were a kid, but that was one of my mom's things. Stop getting in the way. You know, it's, yeah. you know, so, and that's never, that's not a good thing when mom's got a boiling pan of, you know, hot water yeah. or something like that. Julia ended up becoming a household name and, uh-huh. and the, and the dean of modern day television chefs. Without Julia, there would be no PBS food block. There would be no create. There would certainly be no food network. No, or absolutely cooking not. Channel. And, and I mean, she was the, she wasn't the first. Dion Lucas and a couple of people before her did try to do some stuff on commercial television in the fifties that didn't last only a year or two. She had, but a she charisma. was the one that made it work. Yes, she had an innate charisma that drew people to watch her, and her whole attitude that anybody can cook, anybody can learn how to do these things as long as you take the time, and also I think a lot of her. Attitude came across as anybody can do this if the if you have one thing that you're never going to find in a cookbook or in a mix or a bowl or whatever. Mm-hmm. You have to have belief in yourself. Right. And if you have that belief in yourself, which she never came out and, and verbalized, mm-hmm. but if you have that belief in yourself, even if you screw up, you know, you can, you're still going to have something. You made something. You know, you took all these ingredients and did all this and mixed that and baked this and all that. And when it's done, you have something that's going to give people sustenance. You have something that's going to warm people and make them feel good. Mm-hmm. You know, you might have made something that might be somebody's favorite dish from their childhood that conjures up a memory from when they were very young. And that's a really important, beautiful, spiritual thing mm-hmm. to do for another human being. I mean, you can give people things. You can give people cars and jewelry and stuff like that. But if you give somebody something that feeds their soul, that's a million times more important. And I think Julia gave that to people. And I think that's why people remember her over people that came before. She had just this innate charm and natural charisma that just came through the TV that basically said, I believe you can do this. And through that, people went, yeah, I can do this. And it just grew and grew, and that got the snowball going down the hill and made this whole cooking revolution happen on TV, Mm -hmm. which I think is awesome. Mm Mm-hmm. We hope you've enjoyed this little cocktail about Julia because it's leading to our main course this week. I'm Julia Child. Bon appétit. Before she changed the world, Julia Child was just an American living in France. Shouldn't I find something to do? What is it that you really like to do? Eat. And we are so good at it. Look at you. Now, They're growing in front of you. But what does Julia Child have to do with me, lowly cubicle worker Julie Powell? So how's your job, Julie? Are you the person to speak to about my insurance form? You can speak to me. Do you have any power? No. Heartbreak. So sad. Painful. Not in a bad way. I don't know. Do you think I'm lost? I suppose you could call this movie a tale of two cities. You could call this movie a tale of two ladies. Two different eras, two different things, all interwoven by one thing, the food of one particular person. Mm -hmm. Amy Adams and Meryl Streep in 2009's Julie, as in Powell, and Julia, as in Child. Can you give us the overview of this film? Sure. Julie and Julia, directed by Nora Ephron, 
is the story of Julia um, Child, obviously, and Julie Powell. Now, everybody knows who Julie Child, Julia Child is, but probably nobody knew up till that point who Julie Powell was. Well, somebody must have. She got a book out of it, which is what led to the movie. Yeah. So some people knew she was a food blogger. Well, I'm saying until Julie did the blog, oh, I see. nobody really knew who Julie was. Oh, well, right, yeah. The story of Julie and Julia is actually the story of two different books. Uh, the book My Life in France, which is Julia Child's autobiography, and Julie and Julia, 365 Days, 524 Recipes, One Tiny Apartment Kitchen. It was later retitled Julie and Julia, My Year of Cooking Dangerously. This was based on a blog done by Julie Powell, the Julie Julia Project, which was her idea of a way to motivate herself to finish a project. At the point when we meet her in 2002, Julie Powell is a writer who was, you know, tapped in her college class to write the great American novel and so far has not done so. Uh, she is working in a job that is incredibly difficult and to call it soul crushing i don't think is entirely unfair no she worked for the 911 uh, commission uh, yes, doing she, customer service yes she worked for the lower manhattan development corporation dealing with people calling about the um 911 attacks and people trying to find you know victim compensation trying finding out about the memorial stuff like that now you have to admit that is a job that i think i would come home from every day and down a pint of vodka yeah Julie decides that she is going to try something once she hears about a blog written by one of her ex-college friends. She still gets together with these people that she knew in college. Why, I don't know, because they're all horrible. They, they all I have grown into horrible people. Word. I can't really use the word I want to, but it starts It with, rhymes with punt. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the word. That would be it. And I'm not even going to get family show yelled at me this time because I know you agree with me. Yes, I do. So Julie gets the idea to do a blog. The, what she decides to do a blog about once she finds out about the whole blog concept um, with support from her husband, Eric, is that she decides that she is going to cook the entire cookbook, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. She's going to do a recipe every day. And blog about the result. While we are singing all of these things, we are going back in time to seeing just to the life of Julia and Paul Child, who at this time are living in France. Just after World War II. Yes. Yep. Um, Paul works for the American government, and Julia is... Looking for something to do. Yeah. She's kind of at a loss. Um, so she decides that she is going to learn to cook. She well, grew- first she decides she's going to try and make hats. Well, she and just, that didn't work. And well, then she, she tries, tries, she tries to learn how to play bridge. And yeah, she, she tries a couple of things first to alleviate her boredom. <laughs> Hat making doesn't fill the bill, and neither does learning how to play bridge. Goodness knows, I don't blame her there because I'm sorry. I, I've I, never understood that game. I, I am just not don't trying to all. insult anybody who plays bridge. <laughs> I'm sure for people who play bridge and enjoy it, it's a lovely pastime. I would rather try and disarm a nuclear bomb Mm. blindfolded. Mm. You know, it seems like that would be less rule involved. Mm -hmm. Um, So Julia decides that she is going to learn how to cook. And she decides... she knows how to cook. She's going to learn how to cook Julia style. She's going to learn how to cook French. She knows how to do a few things. Oh, you mean Julia. I'm sorry. I thought we were talking about Julia again. Julia is learning. She decides... It's very confusing. Julia and Julia. It's very confusing. She goes to Le Cordon Bleu to learn about cooking, and which is kind of shocking to begin with because she doesn't want to be a professional chef. And the fact that at that time, Le Cordon Bleu was all men. It, you know, it was men who were going to become chefs. Oh, there were classes for the housewife. The housewife. How to boil water. Yeah, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, so French, so France hadn't entirely come out of the dark ages yet, but I mean, 
<laughs> this was the 40s. No insult intended yeah. to the people of France. You're a lovely country. Julia gets the cooking bug and winds up working with these two other women, um, Simone Beck, who goes by Simca, and Louisette, who are working on a cookbook. They or are, American cooks. Yes, they are working on a cookbook of French recipes for American cooks. And they bring Julia in on their project. So we get the ups and downs of both these women's lives as the, as the film goes on. We have Julie's problems with learning how to cook some of the food that Julia has in the book, case in point being the aspic. Uh, and others, <laughs> and other things don't go swimmingly either. We Lobster have. Lobster killer. <laughs> We have Julie's problems at one point in her marriage with Eric. We have the problems that are going on in Julia and Paul's life, including Paul getting brought back to America to deal with being looked at by the McCarthy House Un-American Activities Committee, (coughs) witch hunt, Um, and so on and so forth, with the book being in the background all of that time, right. including problems that Julia has between Simca and Louisette, because Louisette, as Simca feels like, is not pulling She's her. not doing the work. Yeah, well, <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Eventually, it turns out that Julie, Julie actually manages to do it. She finishes everything in the book, cooks all of the recipes, ending on... The final recipe, which involves boning a duck. Get your, mi- a duck. get your mind out of the gutters. <laughs> That's where I am. Yes, and it is. Not this time, though. No. Not for, for a change, I'm actually being above that. And Family not, show, anyway. And, and trying ahead. to act like a lady spit snort. Dad, TC. Um, which she actually succeeds at, because I know if I tried that, I would have cut off my thumb. And she makes a t- delicious meal of it for her for herself and her friends. And she finds out that Julie, Julia, who at the point when this film is taking place, Julia is still with us, has been told about the blog and is less than enthusiastic. Which, I don't think she really knew what the blog was about. Julia wasn't that kind of person. Which really crushed Julie. It and, did. For, for a few minutes, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was after Julie got uh, uh, in the newspaper the day before in the New York Times article that was writing about this girl doing a blog about mm-hmm. Julia Child's cooking. And we're back. In her the, we're back in the past, seeing Julia get her book published in America. Finally, um, finally, <laughs> mastering the art of French cooking. The film ends with this really beautiful uh, scene of Julie and Eric at the Smithsonian, uh, where they have a display of Julia's kitchen from her house. Mm-hmm. This is not a replica. This is her actual kitchen. It's they a recreation it of to, it. They, when she moved to California, they came into her house in Cambridge and took it out with her permission they, and, and uh, recreated it at the Smithsonian, where it still is. Lock, stock, and, and still rolling. a top attraction. Lock, stock, and rolling pins. And yep. <laughs> we get a really beautiful shot of... Julie having her picture taken, and we the the camera pans back to the kitchen, and the cam the 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 fade changes the kitchen from just being static to being the kitchen that Julia lived in and worked in and stuff like that, and we see her and Paul when her book finally arrives, her opening the package and her delight at seeing the actual published book in her hand before it would become a worldwide bestseller. Mm-hmm. What an amazing cast this film has, too. Mm-hmm. Meryl Streep is Julia Child, Amy Adams is Julie Powell, Stanley Tucci is Paul Child, Chris Messina as, as uh, Eric Powell, and they are the four people you see most of in, yes. throughout the movie. But there's also Linda Edmond, who I became an enormous fan of for, due to her portrayal of Simone Beck in this film. Helen Carey as Louisette Bertold, Jane Lynch in a hilarious role as uh, Dorothy, Julia's older sister. Uh, I think she's older. Maybe she's younger. I'm not. She I'm must not be sure. younger. I think she is younger. Uh, 
Mary, Mary Lynn Rachgub as Sarah, Julie's friend, according to Wikipedia. I thought they were sisters. I'm not, no, I might be wrong. No, they were friends. They were, they were college um, friends. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Joan Juliet Buck as the horrible Madame Brassard from La Cordon Bleu. Amanda Hesser playing herself. She was the, uh, the journalist who wrote the article. Deborah Rush as Avis Devoto, Julia's longtime pen pal. If you've never read the book about their emails, or their mailing to emails. Emails? Really, TC? About their correspondences, you, you are really missing something. Um, Vanessa Vertello as Cassie, Casey Wilson as Regina, and Jillian Bach as Annabelle, Julie's obnoxious college friends, all professionals and, you know, met, closing parcel deals and writing the stories and stuff. Yeah. Uh, with Frances Sternhagen as Irma Rombauer, the lady who wrote uh, The Joy of Cooking. Mm-hmm. Um, and also Frances LeBron as the baker's mother, which is a cameo. And Mary Kay Place provides the voice of Julie's mother on the several telephone calls. Yeah. Um, I adore this film. I'm being a Julia Child fan, and we've talked about it on several occasions on this show, Microfocus, everywhere else. I, to me, there is no more perfect uh, film about cooking than this this it, I mean just to me it, it it tells the human story yes. of Julia Child there's, there's a lot of great stuff about Paul and Julia's life that comes out in this film that you don't normally think of when you think of Julia Julia Child and then Amy Adams as Julie I, I got to be freely admit Amy is one of those actresses that took a real long time for me to get into mm-hmm. mainly it's because Julie is so self-centered <laughs> At this time, and I hadn't seen her really at anything else. No, we really. And I really didn't become an enormous fan of hers until American Hustle and Man of Steel. And now I'm a huge fan of Mm -hmm. hers. Um, You didn't even really like her in the Muppets. No, Um, I didn't like her in the Muppets. Didn't like her. I hated Leap Year, and I just like. And there's been all kinds of things she's been in that I didn't care for her in until American Hustle came along, and her her role. She's the best Lois Lane there's ever been, I think. Um, I like the way she plays Lois. She's not so obnoxious and pushy like Terry Hatcher and Margot Kidder were. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, but here as Julie Powell, she's decently self-centered, loves her husband, loves to food, loves to cook, and now knows how to do all kinds of stuff Julia ways. Um, I couldn't wait to see this when it came out. Yeah. We, we were just, I mean, I was scared to death. I was like Meryl, tiny, tiny little Meryl Streep. Is going to play six foot tall Julia Child. How is that going to work? Um, it did. It did. Meryl was brilliant in this role. Damn Sandra Bullock for cheating her out of an Oscar um, for this. I, I was just like, ah. But she's brilliant. And she you had the voice really, down. She had everything down. You were really like, I remember when it was announced that Meryl Streep was going to be playing. <laughs> <laughs> Julia Child, you had the same reaction that I had when you came to me and said, guess who they've cast as Batman? And the second the words Ben Affleck came out of your mouth, <laughs> and all the color drained from my face. <laughs> no offense, Mr. Affleck. No offense to Miss Streep, either. No, I, I, I was always a fan, but, but I just then, didn't think she could I mean. pull off When you Julia saw Child. a picture of her as Julia... No, it wasn't a know. picture. They showed a clip from Julia oh, Julia at the mm-hmm. end of the Oscars in 2009. And your jaw just dropped. And I'm like, holy crap, she's going to pull this off. Yep. And I'm like, wow. It was the and clip. She did. It was the clip of her in the cooking class. Mm-hmm. And it was brilliant. I'm like, oh my God, she's got this. What's the one scene that sticks with you the most, the absolute most? Um, out of the whole movie? Of, oh, geez. I mean, there's um, several wonderful scenes, but I want to hear yours because I have one. Um, well, I love the dinner. Which the dinner? Valentine's Day dinner with oh, Julia yes. and Paul and their friends. Yes, yes. Teasing them about their service in the OSS. And, and then Were finally, you a spy? Yes. Yeah, no. no. Yes, yes, I love that. <laughs> and, of course, where she's doing the whole, you are the butter to my bread, my breath to my life. And Julia's making that, that paper heart flutter with her hand. Yeah, I, that I, was I love beautiful. that. Um, the cooking scene is when she comes, when Paul comes home from work at the embassy the day she started at Lake Cordon Bleu. And she's in the, in, in the kitchen chopping what looks to be like about 50 pounds of onions. Every onion in France. Yeah, it seems <laughs> like it. And she's, you know, Furiously the onions have got her again. She, oh, these men made such fun of me, blah, 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 blah. And she says, don't you want dinner? Uh, no. 
Because there's too many onions in the kitchen. It's it's really funny. Yeah, he does Meryl walk into the room pa- like he's just been mustard gassed. It's Meryl really- and Stanley are so good together. They are. They're just brilliant together. They are. And they make the perfect couple here. For one, there are lots of scenes that get me. There's lots of scenes. There's scenes that get me as a foodie. Um, the scene where Julie is frosting that cake oh, yeah. that she made. Um, that's so, actually not a scene that's in the montage in the where they're montage, playing that yeah. song. Yeah. And I'm just like... Uh, Push on the pack. Yeah. Uh, 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 gimme, 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 yeah, gimme, gimme. Yeah, chocolate cake looks awesome. <laughs> but as a woman, <laughs> as a person, the scene that touched me the most... Another and, kitchen scene. And France, just, yeah. yeah, it broke my heart, was when they're just having a very lighthearted conversation, Julia and Paul. He hands her the mail... Back when people wrote letters, mm-hmm. I realized a certain generation is not going to get that. But they're, and they're still just talking, and she's bringing up that it's a letter from her sister Dorothy, and they're and all of a sudden she kind of stops talking as she's reading, and she says, "Dorothy's pregnant," and she talks about how wonderful it is, mm-hmm. and then and you can see on Paul's face he knows what's coming, and then she breaks down. And Paul is so tender as he as he comforts her. I really never thought I was always like, oh, she must have been just too busy to you know, have Julie a family. couldn't have kids, and it's like and and I just watched that, and I was just my heart just cracked. Yeah, you know, and that was, was that so was her. Resp- she felt and partly responsible for that too. I bet. Huh? Well, that story in the in the film is the truth. Julia introduced Dorothy, intending to have her come visit in France, and introduced her to was going to introduce her to another man that was very tall because she's tall like Julia, and um, she ended up falling for a, a gentleman that worked at the embassy named Ivan Cousins, who yes. who uh, they were was both incredulous tall. about. And the next thing you know, just a few weeks later, they're getting married, and I'm like, wow, Philadelphia Cousins, her do- her her. Dorothy's daughter yes, so um, was news. frequently speaking, uh, frequently doing get, um, shows with Julia in the nineties, talking mm-hmm. about her aunt, and she was uh, quite a quite a personality. You yeah. could definitely see Dort in her. It's without that, question. That just that scene just cracked my heart because mm-hmm. it was, this film is not without its controversies, though, um, which is what happens when you do biographies, you know. We'd, oh yeah, they took they took liberties we'd love with some to, stuff. You know, we'd love to have everything be absolutely exact as it really happened, but unfortunately, life doesn't work that way. Well, what the, are you talking about? Um, the family of Madame Brassat oh. were pissed <laughs> off at the way she was portrayed in the film. Madame Brassat was the woman who was in charge of Le Cordon Bleu at that time, and according to the way she is portrayed in the film, she was pretty mean. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the way they portrayed her in the film. Yeah. Because as I have said a billion times over, every film needs an adversary. Right. And in this film, she's not a, you know, enormous adversary, but she's a roadblock that Julia has to overcome. Right. And she really does come off as a thoroughly unlikable woman. Mm-hmm. And her family in France were Trey annoyed at this um <laughs> at at the portrayal. They were pretty PO'd. Another thing that came out Julia tells the story to Simka when they come to Boston to to um to see Avis Devoto about the book. Avis is acting as their book liter- their literary agent. Um and she tells the the story about how um you know I, how you said how she shows uh, were, were your friend to be here sooner? She's like, well, I don't know. And she reads this letter. Look for a, a lady and she. Ne- they they th- make it very obvious in the film. They, Ava, Avis, and Julia have never met face to face. Right. They were pen pals. At this point in time in their lives, that was not true. Mm-hmm. That did happen about seven years earlier. And by the point that they're talking about in the movie, um, they had probably been back and forth. Meeting each other and their families several times. They, the, the devotos and the, and the childs became very close friends over mm-hmm. the years. And it was the book that they wrote, uh, the, 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 was comprised of their letters is, is brilliant yeah, and wonderful. Yeah. I love it. It was terrific. Yeah. I didn't even know about Avis until I saw this movie. Little, so I was like, yeah, this is something. Little bonks and, little bonks and tweaks aside, Julie and Julia is a fantastic film. 
But please, I will say this one thing because I love you guys. I love our listeners. You're wonderful people, and I adore you. <laughs> um, for this reason, I give you this warning. Do not, under any, any, any circumstances, watch this film if you are even a little bit hungry. <laughs> because after you're done, you will go and eat everything in your refrigerator. The best thing to do is to make make snacks and hors d'oeuvres and stuff and have a little party while you're watching it yeah. and enjoy it. Because it's a terrific film. I We discovered Christmasina in this film, too. Yes. We've really loved mm-hmm. it ever since then. It's hard to believe it's been almost almost eight years since this came yeah, out. Yeah, I know. And it's, it's, it's a terrific film. You can see it all the time on cable. Mm-hmm. And it shows up with commercials on Lifetime and a couple other places all the yeah. time. And it's not on demand. If you've never seen it, it's a terrific and enjoyable film. And if one of those films that it, Meryl Streep just shines in. If you've never seen it, you should see it just because it does put in, it does put in its entirely, isn't it? Mm-hmm. The Dan Aykroyd sketch from it Saturday the Night entire Live. Dan Aykroyd sketch from Saturday Night Live, which Julia thought was a scream when she t- when she saw it. Yeah, and, it and, is and, funny, <laughs> and not for the faint of heart. No, but it's a great movie. We hope you enjoy it and take a look at our main course if you haven't seen it yet. Julie and Julia. This is Kim and TC. Bon appetit. Thank you. You're welcome. Real movies for real people. our network shows depend on our listeners it's you that makes us who we are help us bring you all the best we can become a patreon patron donations start at just two dollars a month and the more patrons we can get the more we'll be able to offer you can get great perks plus exclusive blogs and podcasts available only for being a patron as well it's absolutely fantastic so please become a patreon patron today we need you patreon.com backslash PNR networks if you're looking for great films well that's okay you'll like us anyway subject cinema movies at the multiplex she is destroyed your hammer like a piece of glass. Kneel before your queen. You don't stand a chance. I'm putting together a team. It's me, you, Valkyrie, and the big guy. No team, only Hulk. What's the matter with you? You're embarrassing me. I told them we were friends. Oh, this is gonna be fun. On November 3rd. Hello. Hi. New team. You can't defeat me. New world. So what do we do? We're going to stop her. Ah! Because that's what heroes do. Okay. Good. Great. Great. Thank you. It's the latest installment in the Marvel Cinematic Universe hitting screens all over the country this weekend. Finally, something new to talk about. Chris Hemsworth. Hey, man. I'm Mark cool. Ruffalo, to to Tom Hiddleston, and Tate Blanchett, Thor Ragnarok. Give us the rundown. Okay. Thor Ragnarok takes place two years after the events of Avengers Age of Ultron. Now, during that time, we know that Thor has not been on Earth because that meant he would have been dragged into the mess that was Captain America's Civil War. All of this time, Thor has been searching the galaxy for the Infinity Stones. And his search has come up with Bupkis. At the time when we see Thor, unfortunately, his life is not going all that great either because he has been captured and is in the realm and the prisoner of the fire demon Surtur. Uh, Surtur is, uh, uh, reveals to Thor that Odin, king of the Norse gods and Thor's father, is not on Asgard and that the prophecy of Ragnarok, a.k.a. the end of everything, is on its way to being fulfilled once Surtur places his crown in the eternal flame that burns beneath Asgard. Which is basically all the information that Thor needed. For the, We get the feeling Thor let himself be captured. Mm-hmm. And an enormous fight leads to Thor defeating Surtur and taking his crown... 
and Thor d- coming to the conclusion that because of this, he has prevented Ragnarok from happening. Spoiler alert, not quite. Um, Thor journeys back to Asgard and finds that things are not well. I mean, the people of Asgard think, think things are well. It's a time of peace and Odin is on the throne and everything's great. Except that it's not Odin, which we as the audience knew way back from the end of Thor the Dark World where Loki had um, disguised himself as Odin and is ruling the kingdom in his stead. At that time, we had no idea where Odin was. Um, Thor makes Loki break his disguise, and with help from the Sorcerer Supreme of Earth, Dr. Stephen Strange, yay, um, we find out that Odin is on Earth in the country of Norway, and that Odin is, in fact, dying which is a very bad thing. Obviously, it's a sad thing for Thor and family to lose a member of their family, but Odin's death has other repercussions. The biggest repercussion involving the fact that Odin's death is the only thing that is keeping his firstborn from coming back into this dimension. Um, And I know some people just went, wait, what? Yeah, it turns out that Odin had another child before Thor, and said child was his daughter Hela, the goddess of death, who has been imprisoned by Odin for a very long time. Odin winds up dying, which winds up releasing Hela, which winds up unleashing all sorts of chaos. Hela, actually. Hela chaos. <laughs> We're sorry. Um... <laughs> No, we're not. Anyway. Not really, no, but it's, oh boy. Uh, culminating, uh, a fight that culminates in destroying, I mean flat out destroying, Thor's hammer Mjolnir leads to Thor and Loki being thrown through the Bifrost in a fight with Hela, and Thor winds up crashing on a distant world called Sakar. Sakar, as it turns out, is a planet that is completely covered, and I mean covered, with debris. It's covered with debris falling from the sky because surrounding Sakaar are, I don't even know how many, wormholes, gate points to traveling through other dimensions and such if you're into science. The way this planet looks, think of the beginning of WALL-E, and multiply <laughs> yeah, that. That's what came to mind, yeah. actually, yeah. Think of the beginning of Wally and multiply that by about a billion and a half. And you have, have you have Sakar. Thor winds up being captured by a, by a mysterious female known only as Scrapper 142. And he is brought before the ruler of Sakar, a rather eccentric gentleman called the Grandmaster who entertains the populace with, well, what they referred to on ancient Rome as bread and circuses, the whole idea of gladiatorial fights. And Thor is to be the latest gladiator slash victim of the Grandmaster's champion, who turns out to be a friend from work. (laughs) Turns out that said champion of the Grandmaster is the Incredible Hulk. And it goes on from there with Thor trying to find a way to get back to Earth, defeat, uh, well, trying to get back to, to Asgard, I should say, and defeat Hela before she kills damn near everybody in Asgard and sets out to kill everybody else in all of the other nine realms because, hey, Goddess of Death, it's kind of her thing. <laughs> With Chris Hemsworth as Thor, Tom Hiddleston as Loki, Kate Blanchett as Hela, Idris Elba as Hemdal, Jeff Goldblum as the Grandmaster, Tessa Thompson as Scrapper 142, 
She has another name later in the movie. Tess, uh, Carl Urban as Scourge. Took me a minute to recognize him. Mark Ruffalo as uh, the Hulk, Bruce Banner. Anthony Hopkins as Odin. And appearances by Tadunabo, Asano, Ray Stevenson, and Zachary Levi as the rest of the Warriors 3. Uh, cameo from Benedict Cumberbatch as Dr. Stephen Strange. An appearance in form only by director Takiti, uh, uh, Taki- I can never say his name. <laughs> I'm get this so wrong. Deep breath. Uh, is by by uh, director Takia Watiki. I'm gonna get it. Uh, who did the motion capture filming on on the uh, the the rock character uh, Korg? Right? Is it Korg? Yeah. Korg. And cameos by Stan Lee, Chris ha- Luke Hemsworth, and Matt Damon. So it's gonna and be Sam Neill. And Sam Neil. Oh, and Sam Neil there too? Okay. Yes. Um, and the voiceover uh, cameo also by Clancy Brown. Um, and a video cameo by Scarlett Johansson. Oh, yes, she is. That's right. Yes. Uh, it's the same footage from The Avengers. Right. But, um, okay, so we've been waiting for months, and everybody's been talking about it. What did you think? Um, I thought it was fun. I wouldn't say it was perfect, but I thought it was fun. Now, the one thing that everyone has been bitching and screaming about, about the DC movies. Oh, they're so grim. Oh, there's no humor. Blah, 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 whine, 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 bitch, moan. So Marvel went, okay, and they listened to Well, Marvel's people. always had a, a, an element of humor going through all their films. They have. Particularly Ant-Man. They did. But so. I think Marvel listened to people, and they went, all right, considering the fact that, you know, Captain America Civil War was pretty dark. You know, it, it was a lot darker than a lot of other Marvel films. I think they injected a lot of humor into this, which I don't have a problem with. I thought it was exciting. I thought there was some really beautiful aspects to it as well. I liked the the core message toward the end of the film and there's one character there's one character that goes through an arc of redemption that I really liked I I was like damn I actually didn't see that coming and the fact that it does end in a way that's kind of similar to what happened in Avengers Age of Ultron um I No it is exactly like the end of Avengers Age of Ultron but anyway go ahead I thought it was weird, but in a good way. I I thought the use of music was fantastic. Um, the 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 Led Zeppelin song. Um, it, what what is the name of that song? Is, is that Hammer of the Gods? That's I don't know which one that is. Yeah, that's not the name of the song. I I know it's not. I'm sorry. I'm not a, not an enormous Led Zeppelin fan, but they they use that song you know quite a number of times and. I enjoyed it. I thought where they used it, I was like, "That's." Well, they use it in the trailer, so you're gonna. They use it in the else. trailer, but they also use it in in other places as well. And I was like, "Damn, that worked out really well." Um, I I liked it. I mean, I wouldn't say I was in love with it. I was really happy to see. Uh, I was really, really... Immigrant Song. That's the name of it. I'm sorry. Uh Um, I was really happy to see Benedict Cumberbatch back as Doctor Strange. Even though we saw part of that in Doctor Strange. We did. Same scene. We did, but I still liked the way that... I love his character. I love the way he plays that character. And it's not a spoiler alert to say the fact that, that, you know, Mjolnir gets destroyed, which is in the credits. It's in the commercial. Which is stupid. I think they should have left that alone so it would shock the audience. And the fact that Thor winds up having that glorious mane of hair cut, which is depressing, um, that bothered me. But Mm -hmm. we do get a shot of him pretty much, you know, naked, half naked, so I was happy with that. He was half naked for half the movie. You know, I was like, okay, well, I can live with that. (laughs) There is one point toward the end of the movie where I was like, holy blank and blank, I did not see that coming. I liked it. Like I said, I wasn't in love with it, but I'm intrigued to see where things are going to go. So what did you think? Well... I'm a bit, I, I have been a big fan of most of the Avengers, uh, most of the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe. I have my issues with the Guardians of the Galaxy's films. You have your issue with Star Lord. Yeah, what... I like the films overall. I just don't like him. He ruins them for me. Um, but here's the thing for me: 
When I go to a superhero movie, I want to see a superhero. I want to see lots of battles. I want to see lots of battles that make a difference in the in the grand scheme of things. I'm not interested in seeing um, personal battles for stuff that go on just because, well, whoops, they made a wrong turn in Albuquerque, like Bugs Bunny. I mean, this is the kind of thing. And in all honesty, that's what Takeda Watiki has done. He's produced a, a, a two-and-a-half-hour-long Bugs Bunny cartoon. Um, it's like, I really, the end of the film is an exact copy of Age of Ultron. The end of it is an exact copy of Age of Ultron. I don't know why they decided to go that direction. Because it's like, gee, they did this in Ultron, this in Ultron, this in Ultron. They really did this in Ultron. It, it's the same thing. Exact thing. There's little touches that are different. Uh, uh, Korg is one of the bright spots of this film. Um, I, I really, to me, I want to see superhero action. And when they're in the superhero mode with dealing with Hela and, and, and what she wants to do at Asgard and stuff, they're on their form. But um, the rest of it is a bunch of third grade fart jokes. And I really, I, I mean, what's the point? It, it, I mean, in all honesty, why are you taking the, the who's supposed to be the grandest of all of the Avengers? You know, the most serious, the most, the, the person who is the level headed member of the Avengers more than anybody else except Cap, maybe. And turning in, turning him into somebody doing a second grade, uh, pageant playing a fruit, which is basically what this movie does to Thor. Wow. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm like, don't get me wrong. I liked it. I just didn't like it very much. I think that there's certain parts of it that are really, really well done. The stuff with... I love over-the-top muhaha villains, and Kate Blanchett was freaking perfect as Hela. Loved her in that. Loved the way the headdress always came up when she combed her hair back and the headdress would pop up. I liked the character of Korg. Korg is an interesting um, rock creature who is a prisoner with Thor on, on, uh, whatever the name of the word is, the car, and, 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 you know, becomes a friend. I, mm -hmm. I like that. That's fun. But there was a lot of stuff in this movie that isn't necessary. Thor has this running thing about Hulk that continues over and over again, repeating Natasha's line from Avengers to try and keep him calm. Trying to calm him down. And well, it I, I sounds don't... ridiculous coming out of him. The first time, it was funny. The fourth, fifth time, it wasn't anymore. They, I mean, I'm sorry, it just wasn't. Um, Mark Ruffalo is brilliant here. He's great as Hulk, and he's great as Banner, and he works. It works fine. His part in this movie is is takes an hour and ten minutes to get to, but it's it's one thing that I do like. I think this movie would have been a completely better movie if they had just excised everything to do with Sakar. Everything. Really. I mean, I'm sorry. Jeff Goldblum is basically playing his Apartments.com guy, and and I mean, it's just like what the hell. Why, I like Jeff Goldblum. He's a great actor. Here, it was just like, really, dude? This, this is like out of a 1950s science fiction Buck Rogers thing. I, what? It's like Ming the Merciless, Muhaha, and all that stuff. You just said you like Muhaha kind of villains, though. But not when they're all powerful, like Hela. You have somebody like him? Oh, please, he's, he's a, a joke. More, he's a lot more powerful than you think. But he's a That's... freaking joke. Mm. If Thor didn't have the thing on his neck, he could have strangled him in three seconds. Oh, yeah. All right. So they're, I mean, it's like, really? Um, they're doing, I mean, they obviously had great fun making this film, and I know the critics love it. And I, I mean, most of the critics are not big fans of the Marvel Universe, so it doesn't surprise me. And in fact, it is directed by uh, Takeda Watiki, who is like a in auteur right now for his wonderful movies from New Zealand that he's done over the last few. Mm -hmm. uh, Boy, Hunt for the Wilder People. And, and, all and, a, and a lot of cr a lot of uh, praise goes to him for What We Do in the Shadows. And What We Do in the Shadows. There's a sequel to that coming out. But I come into a superhero movie, I don't want a comedy. I don't want... I don't... Unless it's a, like a spoof, like The Greatest American Hero. I don't want a comedy. And I feel like they took Thor and put him into a spoof, and it just kind of ruined the character. So, I, I mean, 
I, maybe that's just me. I guess that might be just me. You obviously liked it a lot better than I did. I enjoyed the fact that it <coughs> wasn't. I all laughed like, once the entire yeah, film. I know. Once. I know. And it was something that um, Thor had nothing to do with. It had to do with. Uh, it had to do with with Scrapper. It hadn't had nothing to do with Thor. I mean, it was at his expense, but it was funny. And hell, and Hella got me to laugh once too. So I got a, a couple of Snickers. But the whole thing where they're telling. Like, there's this whole extended sequence where he's going through the Grandmaster's, you know, thing, and they're playing Pure Imagination from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Overall, the movie could have also been about 45 minutes shorter. There was no need for this two hours and ten minutes. So, I I, I don't know. I, I was, I liked it, I just didn't like it very much. What's your okay. score? Um, I give it a B plus. Oh, if you like Thor and you and you love it, you want to risk going out and thinking Thor looks like a fool in most of this movie, you'll probably enjoy it. I had less than perfect thoughts, and so you know that's how I am. I give Thor Ragnarok a C plus. No film is too good or too bad for us. This is Subject Cinema. <laughs> All right, Kristen, I am so excited that you've decided to do a podcast with me, but what are we going to do a podcast about? There's so many other movie podcasts. we got to do something original. Well, you know, I'm a big fan of Disney movies. What about something like that? That's just kid stuff. What do we want to do that for? Did you know that The Avengers is a Disney movie or that Pulp Fiction is a Disney movie? Pulp Fiction is not a Disney movie. It's technically owned by Miramax, which is part of Disney. We are still going to talk about the Disney animated movies, though, right? I thought you said that was kid stuff. Well, you know, I've got two kids. i got to be a good dad and stuff. So be sure to subscribe to the Walt Set Me Podcast, where we discuss the various subsidiaries of the Walt Disney Studio, including the animated movies. It's available on iTunes, Podomatic, and wherever you find great podcasts. And I swear, it's not kid stuff. All movies, all the time. Subject Cinema! Deja Vu. What is it, and why does it occur? Just had that little feeling. You ever get that funny little, that kind of feeling, that Vuja Day? <laughs> you know, not Deja Vu, this is Vuja Day. This is the strange feeling that somehow none of this has ever happened before. Deja Vu Review. Westminster of the chickens. All the best breeders are here. They all bring their best birds. They're nitpicking everything. It's the eye color. It's the feather quality. It's the wings, the feet, the toes. It's the whole package. We have a written description of every feather, what it's exactly supposed to be. I've studied my standard of perfection time and time and time again. I've been called you're going to get the neighbors to call the police. Stop it! <laughs> Over the past few days, we have had a chance to see a documentary which had its premiere at the South by Southwest Film Festival this year. And the minute it showed up there, I have been wanting to see it. I have been trying to get a screener for months. It has not shown in the Boston area. But now it is out on DVD for you to peruse. And it is also running throughout the holidays on CMT. Give us the rundown on the documentary, Chicken People. Are you going to keep doing that through the entire review? That's a no. Good. Because that would really cock it up. Um, Oh. I can't believe you went there. You really laid an egg with that one. Well, I guess the yolk's on me. Please stop. (laughs) Please make it stop. It's going to get worse. All right. Okay. All seriousness, here we go. Chicken People is a documentary about people who raise chickens. Now, I know some people might go, fascinating, but (laughs) this isn't raising chickens in the way you would normally think of raising chickens, and these aren't chickens in the way you normally think of chickens. Normally, when I think of a chicken, I think of a bird that's about that big, um, is yes, that, that's helpful on an audio show, that big. You know, slightly less than knee high <laughs> is, you know, brown or white. 
They lay eggs, and when they stop laying eggs, you kill them and eat them. That's it. I never... What do you think this is? Mrs. Tweety's chicken farm? No. But I never really... I never realized there were so many different kinds of chickens out there, like so many different, you know, that there, there, there's so many different colors and chickens that look a certain way. And, you know, you've got tall chickens and short chickens and chickens that look like they made it with dandelions and, and know, ostriches. And ostriches. And, and we should all point out that this is not chickens just for raising chickens. These people raise chickens for show. Right, to show them. Like the Westminster Dog Show for chickens. Well, it's actually not just for chickens, though. We no, found for that poultry, out. sorry. Poultry. It, is, it for is for poultry. Ducks and turkeys also included in yeah, most of them. Yeah, ducks, and turkeys, and geese, and stuff yeah. like that. That people actually do this. Regular people. You know, not like people that you would, you know, not want to be on the same side of the street with. Um, chicken people looks at uh, people that are involved with this. Um, I don't want to call it a hobby because for some of these people, it's a business. For some of them, it's a passion. It's definitely more than just a pastime or a fluke or anything like that. Chicken People looks at several different people um, from all over the country and their processes of breeding the best-looking chickens and the best the chickens that best meet the qualifications in this book that has been, you know, it was written like back in the 1800s or something. Um, I think it was 1907, I think it said on the book, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. But the, the, you know, this, this specific chicken is supposed to look this specific way. And I was like, what the hell do you mean, this specific chicken? <laughs> How many specific kind of chickens are there? Well, this opened up my eyes. <laughs> I'm serious. I never realized there were so many kinds of chickens just in this country. I mean, I can't even think about what, what it must be like in other parts of the world. Holy crap. Um, chicken people takes a specific look at, I would say, three people most specifically. The three people that are involved are Brian Carocker, who is actually a singer. He works in Branson, Missouri, and he his On parents... Purpose. Yeah, and, and his parents actually help him out with his running. He looks like he's in his mid twenties, mm-hmm. maybe pushing thirty. There's Brian Knox, who in his real job is a engineer at the New Hampshire Raceway uh, in New Hampshire. The uh, the uh, what do they call that? Uh, job? Drag race, drag race, drag race, Tra- tractor up there. pulling. And up that's there. another thing about this movie. Now I know what a tractor pull is. And Sherry, I Ma- never knew. And Sherry McCullough, a recovering alcoholic and 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 a housewife and mom. In I believe they said Central Indiana. Mm-hmm. Those are the three focal points of this. Plus, they have interviews with like about I don't know, but at least fifty other people. Mm-hmm. This is a really quirky sort of a film, and I don't mean quirky in a bad way. I don't, because when you think about it, the nicest thing I can say about this film, and I mean this in a really positive way. It does not make fun of its subject matter. No, it doesn't. It treats it it very seriously. Nor does it make fun of, I mean, the subject matter is the chickens. Um, and, you know, this, and it doesn't make fun of the people who are raising these chickens. You know, it doesn't make them look like they're weird or, you know, socially backward or anything like that. I, I I would debate that, but we'll, we'll get to that. Go ahead. That's not the movie. That's just them. It is. Yes, it is. But considering the fact (laughs) that both, both you and I are off the shade of normal. Yes. No, we're not, I'm not going to point fingers. I agree 100%. I am not going to point fingers at anybody else and be like, that's weird. No, I wouldn't either. I think the thing about this film is the fact that these are people that have a passion about something. And whatever you have a passion about, that's a good thing, as long as it's something that you can be like, okay, I'm spending time on this now, and now I'm going to go over here and do something else. When it takes up 24-7 of your time and all of your money, and that you know, and it's separating you from the world in general, you know, that's not a good thing. But, I mean, everybody has their things that they love, that are important to them for whatever reason, you know, with you, I would, I would say if somebody said name something that TC loves, the first thing that would pop into my mind would be music, because you know so much about music, about bands and singers, and when this song was where on what chart and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm a chart person, yeah. And it's neat. 
I mean, watching you just pull that stuff out of your head, it's so cool. I think it's cool. Hmm. You know, I mean, well, I can say the same thing about you and your love for mythology. I depended on you a lot when we saw Moana because you, although you weren't that familiar with the Polynesian myths, you were still able to come up with some other stuff that, that for the ones you were familiar with that is kind of correlated to it. Yeah. Well, everything has things you can kind of say, well, you could, be, you could look at this god and say, well, in this mythology, you could, you know, parallel them and stuff like that. Right. You mm-hmm. know, which, I th- which I've always found really fascinating, that no matter where people are in the world, there are certain archetypes that are the same, the warrior, the wanderer, the trickster, that kind of thing. And the chicken person. And the chicken person. I think that anybody who looks at something like this and laughs should really look at themselves and say, why do you find this funny? Why do you find somebody else's passion funny when some people think it's perfectly normal to paint half your body green and half your body, your body yellow, go stand out in, a, in a field, an open field when it's minus 20 degrees with a foam block of cheese on your head? That's normal. You know, that's being a fan because, you know, that's acceptable. But people look at this and be like, it's weird. I think that this film is actually really a really positive look at these people and what they go through and what they have to sacrifice to um to raise these chickens and you can tell especially the 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 lady we were both kind of like I'm oh, sorry what's her name Sherry McCullough is the woman yes um Sherry at first we were both kind of like okay um but by the end of the film I was like she's really a nice lady yeah. you know and when she's talking about the fact that one of the things that you have to deal with, unfortunately, you know, I mean, a chicken is a living thing, you know, and living things die, mm-hmm. you know, and that she went through a period where a bunch of her chickens got ill. They got some kind of disease that I guess spreads very fast through, you know, if you have like a bunch of chickens, they right. can all get it at once and they all died and they were young chickens and, I mean, when you think about it, I know some people are probably like, oh, that's a chicken. Get over it. But Well, it's your you livelihood. Know. You don't get over it that fast. No. Not only is it your livelihood, you care about them. It's mm-hmm. a living thing. And I would think, especially for some people, I mean, I'm sure for some people it's just a business. But when you watch, you know, you watch an egg and you watch this little living thing come out of the egg on its own, no help from anybody else. They Except do that, maybe you know. some of the other chick, chicks. Yeah, but they're the not egg. doing it on purpose. They're mm-hmm. all they're not all standing around going, come on, guys, Phil needs help, peck, peck, peck. We don't know that. They're not, you know. They might be. We don't know that. But for the most part, chickens or birds, and snakes, actually, yeah. uh, do that on their own. You know, they come out of the egg, boom, they're, they're out. That's it. You know, they open their eyes right, right after they're born. And they're up and walking around. How long does it take us to do that? <laughs> and we're the most of all things on this planet? All right, back to the movie. But I think that this is, it makes, a, it makes something that you would be like, what? It makes it interesting. And you, when you see people actually given prizes for these chickens, you're happy for them. I was happy for them. Although, to be perfectly honest, I don't. I have any idea how you judge a chicken. I mean, I actually don't have any idea how you judge dogs, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. Because when you see a whole row of... No, actually, when you see a whole building full of chickens, first of all, I'm like, oh, man, that's way too noisy. I was <laughs> I was like, okay, I would be outside because I could not deal with that much sound because it's loud. Chickens are not quiet. Animals. It's very loud in the, <laughs> in the building that housed the Ohio Nationals in 2014. Yeah. Very loud. Chickens are not quiet. Um, <laughs> but I'm sorry, when you see all these chickens and you see the person judging them and checking off the things on their little notebook and stuff like that, I'm like, how does that chicken look any different from that chicken look any different from that chicken look any on and on and on and on and on? You know, I didn't see any difference. I don't know about you, but I was like... They well, I thought looked- it was interesting because 
uh, Brian Knox in particular raises a type of chicken that has specific coloring on the on each feather. Mm-hmm. It makes it look like it has this wonderful stencil coat of black on each part yeah. of the feather. I've never seen a chicken like that I've before. I've never seen one and, and it was very interesting to see that. But he, he, you know, he's able to tell exactly what the judges are going to be looking for. He knows that this is going to be, you know, the the slight defect could set it off. That might not be the one to take to the to the to the to the competition, mm-hmm. um, and and he knows inside and out what the judges are looking for. I also have to say one thing, at the risk of sounding like a prude, um, and goodness knows I'd like to think I'm not a prude, but did we really need the scenes of chicken sex? I didn't need that. I really... I am going to throw this computer at your head in a minute. I'm not kidding. Um... <laughs> I mean, I don't know. That actually lasted about as long as chicken sex. Yeah. That's what my point was going to be before you interrupted me. Sorry. It's a truly wham, bam, thank you, ma'am situation. It it really is. And it's not... Which I didn't know. No, and it's not attractive. There is no foreplay. It's just... And now we know how the rooster can do so many chickens in one day. Because he can do them all in one hour, technically. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they... Chickens aren't like other birds. Well, they, no, actually, they did say some of the chickens, some of the roosters do this little, little dancey mm-hmm. thing where they dip their wing and they do. It this depends kind on of, the breed. Yeah, um, but I'm just kind of like, okay, can we please? No, but oh, all right, all right, <laughs> all right. You know, there were there were. The few You've already seasons. talked about it longer than it actually lasted in the film. Yeah. I was kind of like, this is another reason I'm so glad we don't have children because I wouldn't want to be a parent ex- trying to explain that one. <laughs> I I think it's, I mean, if you're someone that grew up in a farm, you probably already knew all this stuff. But if you're someone like me that, you know, grew up in the suburbs. City kid. I, you know, but you, well, you grew up in farm country. You didn't grow up on a farm. Wheat but, country. Huh? Wheat country, not animal country. Yeah, but you were in 4-H. I mean, that has to count. No, I wasn't. Something. I was in FHA. That's a completely different thing. Oh, Sorry. Um, well, what did you think of it? I loved it. I thought it was great. It was a very inter- interesting portrait of these three people in their world of competitive chickens, which I didn't realize existed until this film came out. We didn't what, know there was speed typing <clears throat> contests no. until popular. So. Uh, no, that's true. Um, it truly is a really intimate portrait of these three people. And you might go in thinking, wow, these people are strange. I mean, Brian, who's normally a singer, Brian uh, uh, Carricker, who's normally a singer in Branson, he, he performs with an oldie show there. Um, I mean, he was he was going to lose his job because he wanted to take two days off I know. to go to this competition. And I felt horrible. I mean, what kind of employer would not let you have two days off? Don't you guys have swing and understudy people? Really? Um and, and, I mean, he said some pretty nasty things about Branson. I've actually had friends go there, and they enjoyed themselves. But um, I felt really bad for him. And they all had little stories to tell about past incidences uh, where things had gone wrong. We saw Sherry's. Brian, the two Brians also had problems uh, for, uh, over the years. Um, but they love what they do. They do. They love it with a passion. And that's really something. You don't, it is marketed as a comic documentary, but I don't think it's that funny. There are a few places that are funny because of the stories that particularly Brian Cox has to tell, or Knox, excuse me, Brian Knox has to tell. But it is, um, a genuine portrait of these people, their families, their friends, and the people surrounding the world of competitive poultry showing, which I didn't know existed. No, I mean, I didn't either. You know, it, I gave it a B plus. I give it an A minus. I think it's a really good film and a lot of fun to watch. You might not think you're interested at the beginning, but um, stick with it because it really is ultimately a very rewarding film, and it will leave you without egg on your face. Chicken People is showing now on CMT cable and will be repeating through the end of the year. Although, if you get hungry for KFC, it's not our fault. Oh, ouch. The best movies! Subject Cinema! Want to know what top titles from film and TV are hitting home video this week? Hi, I'm T.C. Kirkham of Subject Cinema, inviting you to check out Tuesday Digidex. 
our weekly roundup of all the new home video releases in the U.S. each week. Whether it's DVD, Blu-ray, or streaming you're looking for, we've got it covered. Tuesday Digidex, every Tuesday morning, from Subject Cinema at eCinema1.com, a PNR Networks podcast powered by Libsyn. Subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast service. Want to know what new films are coming out this weekend? Hi, I'm T.C. Kirkham of Subject Cinema, inviting you to check out 3-Minute Weekend, our weekly roundup of all the new films hitting U.S. theaters each weekend. We've got the 411 on all the new blockbusters, indies, and video on-demand choices for you each week. 3-Minute Weekend, every Friday morning, from Subject Cinema and eCinema1.com, a PNR Network's podcast powered by Libsyn. Subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast service. Your every man's film school. This is Subject Cinema. Going back into the archives of Deep 13 and Mystery Science Theater 3000 all month long on Subject Cinema's uh, film du jour, we're going to be doing some of the Mystery Science Theater shorts Mm -hmm. that they did during the original season because they have stuff that relates to food or can loosely be connected to food. And we've got a couple of them for you today. Mm -hmm. The first one originally aired with The Brute Man. Yes. And we actually found that there are two different, distinct, distinct, different versions of this. Yes, very, very distinct. The first one is The Chicken of Tomorrow. Yes. (laughs) Get used to that. It's going to happen. A lot. <laughs> the chicken of tomorrow. Uh-huh. That which. What? Just commenting. If you keep clucking this up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Go ahead. This is nothing to crow about. Oh gosh, make it stop. Um. Anyway. Uh-huh. All right. Stop. All right. Okay. The chicken of tomorrow short that we got to see with the brute man is a short, uh, at first I was like, the first time we saw this, I was like, what in the hell is, who is this short for? Now, a lot of the shorts that were shown on Mystery Science Theater 3000 were educational shorts. Were educational shorts, shorts, or they were shorts that were shown to people in a specific business. Right. You know, like... Industrial, what they call industrial industrial shorts. Yeah, industrial shorts. Uh, There were a few that were, like, Serials, and they did show three episodes of General Hospital. Right. And it's like, okay, going yeah. back to... This was one of the industrial shorts. Yeah. But for the life of me, the first time I saw it, I was like, are they trying to sell this to farmers? Are they trying to sell it to people who are looking to buy trucks? Well, actually, who is the, this first for? One, the first one, I think, was more the educational one. The second version, the one that I showed you later that I saw this morning, was the industrial one. Because I think, they were, I think that yeah. one was shown, actually, to kids. I don't know. The chicken of tomorrow is uh-huh. about would you would you knock it the f- blank off? Um, <laughs> the one animal impression he can do really well. And anyway, this short is all about what it goes into raising chickens chickens for you know marketing. Chickens, okay. Chick- <laughs> Mm-hmm. The poultry flavored gum, chickens. Um. <laughs> anyway, and apparently there's a lot more to it than just you know having chickens in your backyard and having a little tiny coop. This is for people who are actually looking to do this as a business. So we get this long, long talk. It's about, not that long. Well, it's long enough. Minutes. It's long enough about what what is involved with keeping chickens. You know, in a large scale, you know, farming community mm-hmm. kind of thing, and all the things. It's basically that, getting chicks to market. Yeah. Eventually, and eventually, eggs. And, and the whole idea that you know they have auctions for chickens and eggs and all this and stuff like that, and they're that they're trying to make chickens. Uh, they're going. They're using science to have chickens produce more eggs and more and meat. Having chickens that are plumper and can be, you know, they provide more food. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, you know, great. 
neat. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a lot of funny riffs in this one. I think there's some really good jokes in this. Mm-hmm. But it turns out this is not the only version of the Chicken of Tomorrow. The, oh, no, there's another one. The version of Chicken of Tomorrow that's available on the Internet Archive, and I'll have links to both of them. They're both on YouTube, um, is a more serious one that's designed for the industrial end where it talks about the actual contest, which is only briefly brought up in the other one, mm-hmm. to between the poultry makers of America in 1948 to bring up the level of eggs and the level of meat inside of a chicken. It's narrated by Lowell Thomas. There's lots of dead chickens hanging from little things, and you actually compared it to, you know, World War II stuff. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's not wrong. Um, it's kind of gross if you're not expecting it. It is and it really talks, gross. It um, talks more about the actual mechanisms of getting chicks to the size where they are then um dressed as they say in this in this it, it means the next time you see them they're not dressed they're undressed unfeathered and hanging upside dressed, down dressed is a polite way to say that you take the chicken and, <coughs> and kill it <coughs> you know you kill it pluck all its feathers and drain out its blood Ew. um Disgusting. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm um, watching this going. This is how people become vegetarians. Yeah, you know? and I was I was sitting here. Oh. I was watching it because I was trying to see them oh. both while I was I, uh, this one and the other one. We're going to talk about before we um, did them again because I wanted to rewatch them. And and I went to the Internet Archive. I'm like, this isn't the one I remember. So she was just getting out of bed at the time. I said, you got to watch this and see if this is the one you remember. And then we found both of them on YouTube, and it's like, no, these aren't even anywhere close. No. I mean, the stuff out of the one that Misty had on came directly out of the other one, but it's it's a, it's put up, and, and mostly because it's sponsored by the Texas company, which were the owners of Texaco at the time, had a lot of trucking, petroleum, gas stations, and stuff like that in it. And it was more about shipping. This one's actually about the contest. Yeah. So it was a little bit different. I can honestly say if we had watched the longer one... The longer one is the Misty one. It's two minutes longer. Oh, I'm sorry. If we'd watched the... The original the, one. The original one, I would have screamed myself, They couldn't have made many I mean, comments about that one either, so... No, because it's horrifying. <laughs> I mean, there are scenes where there is just, you know, row upon row of dead animal carcasses. <laughs> You know, I and I don't want to make anybody think that by me saying things like that, that I'm not a carnivore because I am. But I'm also somebody who grew up in the suburbs and, you know, never saw a farm in their life other than, you know, little glimpses here and there. So the idea of what goes in what's involved with going from barnyard to dinner table, personally, myself, I don't want to know. I realize some people might think that's lazy. Some people might think that's keeping your head in the clouds. You know what? Fine. <laughs> Judge me all you want. I don't care. I don't need to know this stuff. I don't need to see this stuff. You know, I was just completely and utterly horrified <laughs> and very glad that I hadn't had breakfast when we watched it because if I did, breakfast would have been all over the carpet. Yeah. Because it was it just... Would have been. Terrifying! <laughs> Move from the chicken of tomorrow to a date with your family. Yes. A date with your family aired originally on uh, Mr. Science Theater 3000's episode um, with uh, Invasion USA. Yes, from the sixth season. And it, fe- it features a, an average, you know, fam- homogenous family of four in 1950s sitting down at the dinner table and is basically about attitudes and and things you can and can't do at the dinner table. Yes. Narrated by Hugh Beaumont from uh, Leave It to Beaver, later from Leave It to Beaver. The whole point of a date with your family is ta- they show how you shouldn't sit down to have dinner with your family and what you should do. Now, the whole thing of this uh, this short is talking about how you should, you know, help your, if you're, if you're a girl, you should help your mother in the kitchen and help set the table and wear a pretty dress and all this other stuff like that. And by this point, I'm puking up blood. Yeah. I can't speak for, <laughs> I can't speak for anybody else. And goodness knows I get accused of being melodramatic, but you know, <laughs> and how you should keep dinner conversation light because that's good for digestion and blah, 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 blah. 
Um, I can, I, I can, well, actually, before I get to my talk, let's talk about you. Did your family eat together a lot? My family? No. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, when my stepfather was in the dinner. picture, we did. did. You eat we dinner? had dinner together, usually. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of the time, it was dinner together on TV trays in front of the television. We didn't actually sit down at the table and eat uh, very mm-hmm. often. What about you? Well, usually when we ate dinner, it was usually, it was in the kitchen. And it was usually my mother, my sister, and myself. Mm-hmm. Because my father worked um, a, a different shift where he would have to go to bed kind of earlier than that. That was the way with I was so, with my father, too. He only, he would come home really late. Like the times that, that we clock, did so. eat dinner together, the four of us, were some of the worst times of my life. <laughs> um and I hated it, and I would have rather have driven a fork into my eye. Okay, then. Yeah. Daddy issues. Big daddy issues. Um, it was usually very, very tense at the dinner table when it was all the, the four of us. I'm surprised anybody actually ate anything, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. The short and the misty and they did for this was absolutely... Brutal. Yeah, it was. Um, considering the fact that one of the first jokes that were that they uh, got off was when the title of the short comes up, the date a date with your family, and Tom remarks that that this is the Woody Allen story. Um, <laughs> one of my not favorite, going there anyway. One of my favorite jokes was uh, at a point in the film where the father and son are talking, and one of the bots. Is speaking as the son, and he's like, "Dad, I had a feeling today." And the uh, the fa- then Mike speaking as the father's like, "Well, don't, son." And you know, it's like that's funny, but it's also really sad because that's the way men were conditioned to feel in the fifties. Yeah. Men didn't acknowledge their feelings and didn't act on their feelings other than anger. And you know, that's why you wound up with a you know, whole generation of type A emotion denying alpha male jerk offs. You know, <laughs> family show. Well, you know. <laughs> I thought I, it's a really funny, <coughs> like I said, yeah. mercilessly funny riffing. It's generally, job. Re- they, generally regarded as one of the generally regarded as one of their best. Uh, it is. Riffing jobs. It absolutely is. Um, it's also included on the DVD collection, um, the Mr. Science Theater. 3000 uh, DVD collection 26 uh, with the sword and the dragon. So if you don't want to go dig out uh, Invasion USA, you can dig that out on DVD. And I actually think well. that, that both of them are available on the shorts collections too, if I remember Probably, right. Probably, yeah. Because I saw, oh, it's when we saw them. Because mm-hmm. we've never seen the brute, the brute Man. So, at least I haven't. So I know I we saw I Chicken I think Farm. I might have seen that one, but I'm not sure. Anyway, we thought it would be fun to go back there and we'll have more food oriented. Stuff from our foul pals at Deep 13 in the weeks ahead. Uh, back when we were going to do a, a summer replacement show of all food stuff for, for Front Row 5 and 10, I actually started to do um, an interesting thing. I, I sent letters out to 35 chefs, not all of them well-known, but most of them recognizable for television, and I asked them, uh, I told them what we were planning to do, and I said... Um, we're planning to discuss films that, that focus on food or how food is a central character and also up re- recipes, offer up recipes and such to our listeners. I thought it might be fun to approach a number of well-known personalities and ask them if they could provide us with a list of their favorite films involving food and why they like them. It doesn't have to be a long list and would be read on the show. And we'll promote the stuff that you're, you know, involved with. Well, I, I, I tried to get to everybody. Over the year, over the, the course of a, a month, before we started doing it, and I heard back from one, all of one chef, and he's not really a chef. He doesn't consider himself a chef. No, Andreas Vistad from uh, New Scandinavian Cooking took the time 
to answer the questions. And I was very much, I, I mean, I, I approached him and I told him when I was writing, uh, on a personal note, I am a huge fan of new Scandinavian cooking. I have my DVR set it to tape whenever it shows up on PBS Create on your local system, uh, on our local system, and I always check it out. I very much like the laid back approach your series takes, giving it a unique feel among the plethora of food shows available here in the U.S. I admit some of the dishes you've ha- featured on the show are out of our reach due to the locality of the ingredients, but I have printed out and tried more than one recipe from the show, and one recipe, one particular episode remains my favorite. It gave, gave me the avornal phrase, angry rhubarb, which completely cracked me up and which I work into conversation on a regular basis. For some reason, that description struck me as hilarious, uh, that chalk it up to my extremely weird American sense of humor. A couple of days later, I got this wonderful letter back from Mr. Vistad. It says, uh, thank you so much for your kind words. I think that food in films is extremely difficult. Uh, most movies that feature food do it as a pretext for something else. If there's a dedicated chef, the food is often there to illustrate a point, something about his or her personality. Most often the food could be replaced with something else. The chef could have been a painter or architect, and the movie would have been more or less the same. And while you are sometimes seeing cooking or tasting, ah, delicious, you almost never see eating. But one movie with a great food scene is Down and Dirty by Etior Sciola, director. There is a long scene where the incredibly disorganized and dysfunctional family come together for a meal with the much-hated patriarch, Giacinto, who we see eating a big bowl of pasta. The scene goes on forever, just like an Italian meal, enhanced by the fact that the dish is laced with rat poison. The extended family has come together to kill the father. Gritty and disgusting, but unforgettable. And it's signed, Andreas. Andreas, Mm -hmm. Mr. Vistad, Thank thank you so much for responding. And I do so enjoy new Scandinavian cooking. And, uh work angry rhubarb into conversations all the time. He does. Um, and I'm really glad that they did because it's 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 one of those things where I thought, I know so many chefs who who have said or are personalities who are known to be um, cooks out there enjoy movies a lot. And I was hoping to get some of their feedback and unfortunately we didn't get any, but uh, except for from Mr. Vistad and I thank you so much for doing that and uh, we hope you enjoyed his reply. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. You really are a heel. You're as cuddly as Oh, it's time for the inaugural Grump Edition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for 2017. The Grinch Watch is back. Yep. We have three offenders in just, well, two offenders in one praise this week. Yes, we do. Starting with Burlington Mall. Burlington Mall is over in the other part. It's another suburb of of uh, Boston, Burlington Mall, um, on the main road. Which which highway is that? One twenty eight. Yeah. That goes down through Woburn and all those places. And Burlington Mall introduced Santa Claus this week. Yes. Uh, uh, two days before Halloween, he was there. No, day before Halloween, he was there on Monday. Mm-hmm. Really. Honestly, this it's is not even it's... November yet, and Santa no. is there. No, it used to be that. As far as your generation and my generation were concerned, Christmas began at 12 o'clock on Thanksgiving when Santa Claus, you know, finished the Macy's Day Parade. Yep. You know, the last thing you saw on TV was Santa and his reindeer riding down the street to close out the Thanksgiving Day Parade at Macy's. Yep. And Thanksgiving's over, and now that that's That was the Christmas. official start of the Christmas season. Right. right. And that worked out fine for us. I don't know when people decided, nope, we have to change People stuff. didn't mm-hmm. decide that. Corporates decided that. Yeah. Um, and I mean, some parents were okay with it. Others were like, why are they doing this when my kids are still having Halloween candy? The, when they saw in there on, on Wednesday. I mean, they just got Halloween candy on Tuesday. And yeah. already it's Christmas time. They're totally forgetting about Thanksgiving and Veterans Day and... <laughs> other, other. You know, it's ridic- It's <laughs> completely ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Some people are saying, oh, well, it gets the kids used to Santa. Mm-hmm. 
earlier yeah. and stuff like and that. BS. Um that is nonsense. That is complete and utter nonsense. Yeah. The second thing is our own showcase cinemas. Mm-hmm. Showcase cinemas in Revere has gigantic Christmas trees and Christmas displays up in two places. Now, they get a sort of a break because Christmas movies usually start hitting theaters in October and November. Mm -hmm. This past week, uh, A Bad Mom's Christmas opens, and this coming weekend, Daddy's Home 2 opens. Daddy's Home 2 is set at Christmas time, and they have a ton of promotion for it at Showcase. But it wouldn't be so bad if they had left the one over across from Chatter's, the restaurant, which is large, and it actually has a sign that says, Daddy's Home 2, filmed at Showcase Cinemas Revere, which we can find no proof of, by the way, not according to the IMDb. There's no mention of Revere, although they did film, obviously, in Showcase Cinema, because Will Ferrell did that thing at the beginning of the yeah, movie. Yeah, they also did, it does say they filmed in Boston, so right. if this is one of these, oh, well, Revere's a suburb, so that counts, we don't know. No, you know. But, um, but they also took up half of the bench seating in the lobby, Put it right up against that. So you've lost seating for 20 people. Yep. And I'm like, why did you do that? That's ridiculous. And for a movie that's probably going to do well, but that we have no interest in. Nope. Will Ferrell and, and, and Mark Wahlberg? No, no, I'm sorry. Not, not, not doing that. Uh, third is a good thing. Yes, third is a thumbs up. And it's strange because we're always, we're always, you know, sp- spitting on, um, commercialism here, and we're always, you know, talking about shaking our fists at the, uh, the, the conglomerates and the corporations out there and stuff like that. But we do have to give a pat on the back to Target, who apparently listen to their, um, customers, who have told Target, stop putting Christmas stuff up, Christmas trees and all that stuff up before Thanksgiving. We don't like it. And Target said, okay. okay. So as of right now, they're not going to be putting all of their Christmas, you know, decorations and trees and all that stuff up before Thanksgiving. I, I bet it will appear the Monday before Thanksgiving, but that's still better. That's much better. I mean, when you consider the fact that we went to CVS on Halloween night, <laughs> um, we had to grab a couple of things, and we also thought maybe we can score some marked off candy. And that it was too full of Christmas candy. Yeah. There was barely any Halloween candy left because they'd put it all away to put up two aisles full of Christmas candy. Mm -hmm. Who in the blank is going to buy Christmas candy in October? Beep, beep, beep. Chocolate snob alert coming. No, I'm not even. No, I'm not even being a chocolate snob about it. Although I wouldn't buy that. You said it'd be stale. Well, that's that's not being a chocolate snob. Being a chocolate snob is saying like I wouldn't buy some of that cheap plonk if you paid me, but. It's not cheap, believe me. But the fact that, yeah, I'm sorry, some of that chocolate's going to bloom by December. Who's going to want to eat that? I wouldn't want to eat that. And you don't even have to be a chocolate snob to say that. Okay. But anyway. That's the first edition of the Grinch Watch for 2017. There'll probably be more. Here's our list of 25 crazy differences between the Harry Potter movies and books. Twenty-five, nearly headless Nick's death day party. We frequently talk about things that we see on YouTube the all the time, but one of our favorite channels is List Twenty Five. List Twenty Five has all these great, it's completely crazy lists. To, I mean, they're just. But it would have been very cool some of them could be nuts, and some of them are straightforward. Where the heck? Was the two Wendy? young men that are most prominently running this site, really <laughs> Mike Estrin and and Tristan Frower. Um, the, every every year around Halloween, they produce a gigantic tribute to Harry Potter. They're both huge Potterheads. And on the end of the Halloween version of, of List 25 this year, it's 25 differences between the Harry Potter movies and the Harry Potter books. Uh, you, that's, a, that's a straightforward List 25 list. Mm-hmm. Except at the end of the list, which normally lasts about 10 minutes each or 15 Shows the end of it actually cuts off and shows Mike recording it, and they get into this 20 minute long wizard battle. And it is a freaking riot, as usual. They yep. did this the first time last year, and it was brilliant. Tristan's a filmmaker. Um, he's, I f- 
I want to say he got a, a he's got a degree from University of Miami, but I might be wrong. And he does a great job with special effects. If you're a Harry Potter fan, you'll enjoy the hell out of it. Yeah. Although it gets a little bit goofy, and they deliberately can't help it because they film it in their apartment building and in their courtyard. I mean, it's, it's there's at one point there's ducks or geese getting in the way. They make the mistake of crossing, um, uh, uh what is it? Cro- crossing, um. Brands, yeah, is that what it would be uh, universes. They cross universes, yeah. one time, and 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 it's it's really funny. But the two of them are so. Kristen is so brilliantly creative. Anyway, he has his own YouTube channel, and I'll also have a, a link to that in the site. But if you are if you want to introduce yourself to List Twenty Five, this is the one to start it with. It's long. It's almost a half an hour. It long. It really is funny. Um, the whole differences between the Harry Potter books and the Harry Potter films was really educational and enjoyable. We don't need it. We have Stacy. Um, <laughs> hey, yes. Stacy. Um, who sat there with us watching all of the Harry Potter films. And, and the Twilight films. And the Lord of the Rings films. Oh, and the X-Men films. Yeah. Um, Stacy, who sat there during all of the Harry Potter films and said, that didn't happen that way, that didn't happen that way, that happens in the next book, that should happen, you know, earlier, later, blah, 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 you know, and right. we're going, shut the F up, <laughs> we're trying to watch the effing movie. Because we've never read the books, yeah. in all honesty. Which we also them. got screamed at yeah. for. Um, I enjoyed this, I thought it was a lot of fun, although I do have one tiny quibble. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I've watched the Harry Potter, you know, films enough to know that in the Harry Potter universe, when you cast a spell, you're supposed to... You need to, to be vocalizing You have to it. verbalize and it. And they don't do it. And they don't do it. They don't do oh, the it only one he, The only one that he... The only one that Mike verbalizes is when he opens the door with the Aloha, Alohomora. Right. Which started out sounding like he was going to do a Kamehameha from now, Dragon Ball. There's bloopers <laughs> at the end, too, by the way. So it yeah. did, I actually thought that. I'm like, is he going to do a Kamehameha with a wand? Can you do a Kamehameha with a wand? I'm like, I don't think that's going to work. So if shout he, out... Uh, shout out to List 25 and Mike Astrid and, and Tristan Frower for yes. en- for once again entertaining the hell out of us with one of their wizard battles. Yeah. It was a it was a riot. And I have to be on Mike's side anyway because I'm a ri- I'm, I'm a Hufflepuff. So. The whole, and not only that, <laughs> the whole thing apparently the, the the premise of it is that it started because Tristan lost the poll, uh, and the people who spoke on the poll said that they liked floppy bacon better than crispy bacon. Mm-hmm. And 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 it, it, it it's really funny. So check it out, list twenty five dot com, and you can find their YouTube site by searching list twenty five. And we'll have a link to the to the thing in the, in the actual show notes. Nobody asked me, but I don't like floppy anything better than you know. Yeah, and if Mike won and he picked floppy bacon, uh, Mike deserved to lose. <laughs> We've had this sitting around for a couple of months, and I apologize to our friends over at K-Battle for not getting it on the air. It was also supposed to be part of our summer show that we didn't get done because of things that happened over the summer. We hope that you'll enjoy it as we take a look at an original installment of K-Battle Eats Odd Things. It's time for Cave Babble Eats Odd Things. Cave Babble Eats Odd Things is a very special time during which some, if not all, of the hosts of the Cave Babble Podcast get together to eat odd things. Well, at least they're odd to us. Maybe not to you. Why don't you join us and find out? Kevin, tell us about this. What did you bring? Thought things are not so uh, we went to the store and I was looking for grapefruits and I didn't have grapefruits and that was next to it. And I was like, oh my God, what is that? And Kevin said, I don't know. And, and so, so we picked it up. Yeah, it's a pomelo. A pomelo. This, is, this one's a red pomelo. It's about as big as that run on sentence you just made up. <laughs> <laughs> I always do run on sentences though whenever they I don't know exactly how to cut it. Maybe It's just about cut the size it of a small. Half and see what is this size. We'll think of an orange. It's about the size of a small honeydew. Yeah, it does. It looks like a small honeydew. Whoa! It's like a grapefruit. At least 60% of it is not fruit. Wow. That's so weird. Mm -hmm. A little fruit. It smells like a grapefruit. People are probably going to be like, it's not even ripe. Don't do it if it's not all the way through. Yeah, right, exactly. It looks like a human flesh. (laughs) Yeah, it looks like you cut open a thing and now you have like these slabs of bacon 
It oh, kind of does. It, it looks, looks like, like slabs of bacon. Yeah, it kind of looks like. I'm not sure quite how to you eat it now. I think you feel the white because mm-hmm. that's going. Yeah, to the white you probably feel the white. Pithy. It's going to be a little pithy. You peel away the bacon mm-hmm. fat. Mm-hmm. It smells like. Oh whoa! Yeah. On the inside, it's all fuzzy. It's fuzzy. Yeah, I feel oh, that. Oh, it is fuzzy. Oh. It has little hairs. It's kind of cute. It kind of makes me think of a dried apple. It's kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's got an interesting, yeah, like a dried apple texture, the rind. And then I take it you just eat the, I mean, the it, peachy part of it, huh? So anyone know if they're allergic to pomelon? <laughs> it has a good, about three quarters of an inch of rind. Oh, I, oh yeah. And it looks like cotton candy. That, it it kind of just, yeah. The outside kind of peels away. It feels uh-huh. like cotton. Like cotton candy. Like yeah. cotton. Yeah. No, what well, this tastes like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. All right, smells. Smells good. Like a grape it smells like an orange. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Yeah, it yeah. smells more like an orange. Yeah. It does smell more, mm-hmm. more like an orange. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're right. It I'm does getting smell juices like all over the That's table. table. <laughs> so definitely juicy. Yeah, okay, it's shall we take a taste? And and yeah. All right, here we go. Mmm. Mm. Sounds like an orange. Ooh. Dude. Oh, that's tasty. Okay, and then the very end. There's the grapefruit. Uh huh. Yep. An orange grapefruit. It's so like a bitter hybrid. orange. Hybrid. Yeah, it's a bitter orange. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh. Oh, <laughs> oh, God. Wow. The aftertaste. Oh. Woo! Okay. The aftertaste of the young. Oh, you I love it. That's because yeah, you, so you, you keep eating it. You keep eating it. So <laughs> so you oh, wait wait it. for it. Wait till it ends. And don't get the aftertaste of the. It is good. I still it goes. <laughs> <laughs> it has a static aftertaste. <laughs> it has a very bitter. Mm. See, I'm mm. with Kevin. I don't taste the bitter aftertaste. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you guys biting a huge chunk at it? Yeah. There's a little fleshy part that's in between the. Yeah, oh, no. Okay. I've been oh. I've been eating around that. I'm just eating the drinking oh. the juice. Yeah, I'm been uh-huh. smashing. I'm officially creased out because there's the fact that I see a vein right in the middle of it. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's weird. I ate mine. I'm well, just this, eating the, well, this put this, the this rest of it. This inner flesh is really cool, though. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. like the rest in a bag for you guys to take back home. It's like it's cotton batting. It's it's like it cotton. really is, yeah. It's, it's like, like stealing cotton. It's mm-hmm. like, a, batting. yeah, quilt batting. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so fluffy. I mean, we don't know anything about this fruit. Mm-hmm. Where does it come from? Is it grown in... It's grown by Mr. and Mrs. Plumella. Is it a hybrid? Is it a... Yeah, I would imagine with the rind being so fibrous, you could almost no, it's an electric. Use it for something. Use it for caulking. Yeah. You really could. Mm-hmm. Honestly, you could if you Quite dried fibrous. it out a little bit. You could use it for Paint. water, like what they're doing sealer. with. I mean, the uh, weather sealer. Mm-hmm. Okay, similar to uh, similar prints to a large grapefruit native to South and Southeast Asia. Okay. Okay. They eat them all the time there, probably. Wow. You know, if eaten raw, it's very poisonous. <laughs> don't <laughs> Whatever you do, rind. cook it first. To anybody on keto, one fruit has 59 grams of carbs, so please oh. just don't do it. <laughs> don't uh, eat this. Yeah. So if you're on a keto diet, do not eat the whole but thing. Six, 619% vitamin C. Wow. Wow. Oh, so good source of vitamin fruit. C. For a fruit. Oh. oh, okay, for the entire fruit. Yeah, yeah so you've already had 100% already, Amber, there. Uh. That is, I liked it. Yeah, I thought it was very good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the juice of it. It's, yeah, it's honestly not. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really tasty in that first when you first have it, and then it has a bitter aftertaste. What? Some medicines may interact dangerously with pomelos Uh-oh, like and some pomelo hybrids. Oh, great! Uh, like what? Mm-hmm. Uh, it does not say. No matter cocaine. what you do, do not take Zoloft. Zoloft. Do not take cocaine take with this product. Cocaine Zoloft with this product or thyroid I'm medication. Sure I'm sure that's the same thing with a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. That was that very was really yummy. Mm-hmm. 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 That definitely looks flesh like now that you have, yes. that you have left over. Oh, yeah, it, it totally looks like flesh. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> you tell him, Caius. Say, it looks like flesh and looks like bacon whenever you cut it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, babble, babble, eats our things. Bye bye. Cave Babble Eats Odd Things.
save our screens. Okay, everybody, this video is going to be different than what we normally do. And it's not good. I have to sit down. <laughs> yeah, we're in big trouble. There's a huge problem with our views and audience interaction. We have to stop making videos. We don't want to, but we have to figure this out. Why does this feel so weird? Mm, no background music. All right. Cloven Boots is basically run by just two guys. The sad fact is views are plummeting, and they can't afford to keep making videos right now. <laughs> stupid view problems. Stupid no money. Stupid having to pay rent. <laughs> what the hell, Gorilla? It's been a long time since we've used that music at the beginning of one of these segments. And it's actually not for a screen this time. It's for a site. We're going to change it to save our sites. YouTubers all over the world are getting deep in trouble because their listener, their, their viewership is dropping like a stone due to a new algorithm that was introduced about six months ago. And one of the channels affected is our beloved glove and boots. Um, I am not happy with this. Last Friday, I was going to bring it up last week, but I wanted to do a little bit more research on it. That's why we waited a week. Last Friday week, Glove and Boots posted a, a video explaining that they're going to be shutting down for a while because their listenership is, is, is not there anymore, and they don't know what happened. They actually did a good job of covering the interesting stuff with the new algorithms, yeah. which was first introduced several months ago. A lot of YouTubers have been complaining, and Hank Green has been even uh, complaining about it, and Hank is like... You don't mess with Hank. No. Um, could the, I could I do the cliff notes of the YouTube of the YouTube thing? Sure. Basically, YouTube is cutting its own throat. Yeah, a lot of these creators are starting are going to start leaving YouTube because of their viewership. Mm -hmm. Although they also had a hand in it, and so did Facebook. Facebook a couple years ago decided they didn't want reposts of YouTube on their site, so they tended to knock them down on your uh, on your subscribers list. Now, they didn't get rid of them. They were still there if somebody came over and looked at your actual page. But on their on anybody's subscriber list, they would get knocked down. So Glove and Boots started uploading all their stuff to both YouTube and Facebook, and that's what started the problem. Mm -hmm. um, Glove and Boots is quite simply the funniest freaking channel on the Internet, bar none. Uh, Mario and Fafa and their, and their assorted group of characters... This last year went nuts. They managed to get a good deal of money from their YouTube channel, and they went whole hog producing yeah. shows every week. Mario's Word of the Week, the Glove and Boots Gaming Channel, a whole bunch of stuff. And now, for all this hard work, they're being penalized by YouTube. Yeah. What the f it's, is going on with ridiculous. this with this thing? So we're asking you. Go over to YouTube, type in Glove and Boots, and then also Glove and Boots Gaming. They're two separate channels. Go through their channels, like their videos, subscribe to their, their notifications, click the bell and subscribe to the notifications. Watch them and let them know in the notes that you love them. A lot of their fans on the, on the, I mean, the Trump, the we're in, we're in deep trouble video. Ends with a hilarious parody of Thelma and Louise. Yes. Um, and, and, and it's it's great. But a lot of people in the comments are saying, you guys need a Patreon. They don't do a Patreon right now. If they go to Patreon, which is likely to happen, I would think, if, they, if, they're, if, they, if they're really smart about this, I'd pay... I pay to be a patron of theirs. I love them. They're, they're truly, I mean, some of the people are like, you guys can't leave. You guys are the one thing that makes my life bearable. You're so funny. These guys are just, they're riot. And, and, and the, the gaming channel, especially, which started this year, has been a freaking scream. Mm -hmm. So is their live shows that they've been doing at the YouTube headquarters in New York. And it's all for a, a, a simple red monster and, and a groundhog. Yep. And and gorilla occasionally. And Johnny T. Uh, Bafa's cousin. Yes. Um, th this is not right. Why is YouTube doing this? Well, to tell you the truth, my honest opinion, our YouTube channel doesn't matter that much to us. We're getting a lot of, you know, extra people over. But we're not monetizing. We're not interested. It's simply a separate outlet for our primary outlet, which is eCinema1.com, and our subscriber outlet, which is Libsyn. So, 
you know, we're glad that you're out there and, and checking us out on YouTube, SoundCloud, and all these other pod uh, sources. But we're, we're leading you back to do one of the two that we, we always right. have. And so, you know, our subscriber count has plummeted since we left Mevio by no choice a few years ago. And for some reason, you know, the listenership that was way up there is down, but I don't think it ever was. I don't think it was ever way up there because Mevio's stats were never reliable to begin with. So we keep plugging these, plugging our shows and getting shows out there because we know we have a small but loyal core following Mm -hmm. and we love you guys. We wish you'd Patreon us. We really do because we could do a lot more with a Patreon support from you. But we, we really appreciate the fact that you download and listen. It's more important than ever. Subscribe. Anybody you watch on YouTube, anybody, Glove and Boots, Hank Green, uh, you know, uh, Popcorn and Roses, Subject Cinema, anybody, when you play the video, like it and subscribe with the notifications. Do the same thing. If you're on iTunes, like it, leave a comment. If you're on SoundCloud, like it, leave a comment. Don't let the, the people producing this stuff Go by the wayside because, you know, it, it only takes you a minute or two to do that and it helps more than you could possibly imagine yep. right now. I'm going to be so pissed if we permanently lose these guys. They're so funny and so out of this world and they were nice enough to, to send me a shout out when I let them know that we talked about one of the gaming shows here. Mm-hmm. And it was nice and I love that and, and they're terrific. Please support Glove and Boots, find their two sites, like them, subscribe them, leave a comment, and tell your friends to do the same. Share the videos, post the YouTube links on your blogs, in your email. Some of them are brilliantly funny. I still can't, I still continually push, even though it's older, we still continually push the vertical video thing because it's just so freaking funny. Mm-hmm. And their parody of uh, Blurred Lines, which we had us on the floor. Yep. You got to, you, I mean, you got to help these people. These people work tons of hours, and a lot of these people, like Glove and Boots and stuff, this is their job. They're doing this full time. This is why we haven't yep. done that yet. Yep. And it, and just like, you know, they need your help. So please help us save Glove and Boots and anyone else having problems on YouTube. Get out there. Be proactive. Don't just be a passive listener or passive viewer. Yeah. Don't Click, think somebody subscribe, else is do it. and pass the word around. Yeah. Don't think somebody else is going to do it. You do it. Don't let YouTube become a, a corporate... Another extension of just regular network or Lipson or any of the other ones. We yeah. don't want the same thing to happen to Lipson and YouTube that right. happened with Mevio. Right. Mevio just gave up on its podcasters and went all video and threw all of its podcasters off with no warning. Yeah, YouTube, we don't want that to happen again. YouTube started out as a place where people could post their own videos or their own editing of other stuff, but with their own unique spin on it. It was about videos for people by people. We want to keep it that way. We need to keep it that way. And we also should be, you know, no, don't, don't let Zuckerberg off either. That, that thing where they decided they have to have their own original videos, that was strictly for advertising dollars on, on Facebook. And now look at them. They're sitting in front of Congress because half of their advertising has come in the last year from fake news sites out of Russia. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of explaining to do. Yeah. And, and it's like, okay. Come on, we got to band together. If we want to save what we love, what the people enjoy, you got to take a proactive stand and start liking, subscribing, Patreoning, and doing anything else. And don't forget to subscribe to every single site your favorite sites do. Even like us, we have a lot of, we're out there on Podbean, we're out there on YouTube, we're out there on SoundCloud, we have Twitters, we have Instagrams. Make sure you're around that because the more you do that, the more you surround yourself with what you like, the better chance it's going to have of sticking around. Mm -hmm. You have any questions about this, take a look at some of the uh, videos that are out there. I don't know what I'll have up in the links yet because I haven't been able to, but um, Glove and Boots does a great explanation of it, and that, that will be in the link, and you can definitely see what's happening. We don't want to see these guys go away. Mario and Fafa, we're going to fight for you all the way. 
I think our first scrumptious banquet went very well. Me too. I think we're going to have lots more. We're going to have to, you know, I think we should try to focus on our final week on all dessert stuff. That would just make sense. Yeah, it would actually. And, and we can have all kinds of things. We'll consider this our appetizer, and we'll do our main course and our, mm-hmm. our other stuff as the weeks come ahead. Uh, once again, as if not to drum it into your head, but if you're a fan of Subject Cinema, make sure you come around all of our sites. And when you listen to the show, no matter where you listen to it, please like us. Please subscribe to our notifications wherever they would be on iTunes, YouTube, or anywhere else. Don't forget to download the Subject Cinema app, uh, which you can download right from our website notes. Just click on the app button. It's for Android only at this point. I'll have an iTunes app up as soon as I can afford it. And, uh, but it has all four of our main shows from Subject Cinema, which also includes Front Row 5 and 10, um, Three Minute Weekend, and Tuesday Digidex. And you can catch it all there on the go on your phone. And don't forget to please become a Patreon patron. Patreon is an important part of our, of our, uh, our overall plan. And the more patrons we can get, the more we'll be able to do for you. We'd love to be able to do a lot more than what we're doing right now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the plans we had this year fell through because we didn't get enough help. And hopefully, as we come close to 2018, you will jump on board, come aboard for a, a, a however much a month starting at $2, get some great perks in return, and, uh, become a Patreon sponsor. And you should do that for anybody you listen to that has a Patreon. Uh, because they really need your help. It's at ours is at patreon.com backslash PNR networks. Yep. Platinum Roses Garden was delayed this week because of, of something going on yesterday. So yeah. we'll have it up later today. Yes, it's it probably already up by the time you hear this. Uh, this week's uh, episode of Platinum Roses Garden, I am looking at this past week's episode of Supernatural The Big Empty as season 13 continues on. And I hope you will come check that out. And I hope you will check out TC's uh, solo show, his uh, look at disaster movies every other week uh, on Catastrophe Vortex. New show coming this Wednesday. uh, We'll have lots of great stuff, and we hope you'll listen to that, too, at CatastropheVortex.com. Don't forget to check out Anthony's blog at at, uh, ComicGrotto.com. The show's on, uh, has finished its first season, and we'll be back in January with new shows. But Anthony continues to blog with all kinds of great stuff over on their website. And Kate Babble with Eric and Valerie Lyon, you heard them today. Um, is uh, always doing great new stuff with uh, you know movies, TV, games, food, and a lot more at kbabble.com. We have a couple of big press special projects coming up after the first of the year that we'll talk to you about soon. Mm-hmm. And we also have a big December coming up. December is going to be a catch-up month. We're going to be spending the whole month in the review mode doing uh, 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 um, a review well yeah actually you're in review Re- mode reviewing, uh, reviewing, and reviewing some stuff and that we've missed a lot of films we haven't seen yet that we haven't had a chance to see all year getting ready for the poppies and rosies on new year's eve and having a lot more stuff uh, going on and as we get into 2018 some new other new stuff coming up including a big project which will be coming up in mid january mm-hmm. and i hope you guys will all enjoy it it is exclusively to youtube and we hope that you guys will enjoy um i don't know what we're going to do for sure next week we've talked about some movies we're going to haven't nailed it down for sure but i think it's going to be good uh what about you um, I'm sure we'll come up with something fun and don't forget to check out Front Row Five and Ten this uh, Thursday. Yep, uh, right here on this very same channel. And don't forget to check out Subject Cinema's websites: eCinema1.com, eCinemaBoston.com, and our variety of other sites. Mm-hmm. All part of the PNR networks. There's a menu and uh, buttons you can push on every site to check them all out. Yep, I have a lot of new stuff coming to eCinema One in the next six weeks. That's I've right. been working on some new, cool new stuff that I think everybody's going to love. Okay. On that note, um, I think I'll take that one and that one and that one. And, oh, hey, that one too. Beep. For Subject Cinema, I'm T.C. Kirkham. I'm Kim Brown. May your popcorn always be buttered. And may your roses always be in bloom. And now, the dinner is over. Check, please. You have been listening to Subject Cinema with hosts T.C. Kirkham and Kim Brown. Subject Cinema is produced by PNR Networks, Boston, Massachusetts, which is solely responsible for its content. Subject Cinema theme performed by Eric Lyon. 
Subject Cinema is recorded and produced using Sony Vegas products. Subject Cinema is copyright 2017 by PNR Networks under a Creative Commons license. Check out a new episode of Subject Cinema every weekend. Until next time, this is Bob Taylor for Subject Cinema, and we'll see you at the movies. That's all! Podcasting's choice. From coast to coast, continent to continent, right here, 24-7. 